We'd like to welcome everybody. This is um, our first presentation that, of the Friends of Mrs. Scoy for the year. Um, and we're glad you made the time to join us this evening to find out what is so special about the Mrs. Scoy National Wildlife Refuge. My name is Julie Filiberti. I'm a member of the board of the Friends and we're really happy to be hosting this event tonight in conjunction with the Green Mountain Audubon Society. And it's the first time that, um, that we've done that. So in a moment, I will pass the baton over to Jeff Hulstrong from GMAS, and he can tell you a little bit about their organization. But first I'd like to introduce you to our friends group. For those of you who may not be familiar with our work or may not be a member of um, our group, so we are a nonprofit group that basically works to support the refuge in whatever way we can. We work to promote awareness of the refuge through public outreach, organize educational and fun events such as this one tonight, conduct monthly monitoring bird walks on our trails. We had one coming up um, this Saturday, but we postponed it for a week because it's supposed to be frigid on Saturday morning. Um, we donate funds to support education on the refuge for um, children and adults. We give financial support to the refuge when it's needed for something that those federal dollars just don't necessarily support. We work to assist the refuge in acquiring grants for invasive, invasive species control. And we work with the refuge, refuge manager, Ken Sturm, to provide any assistance that he deems helpful for the operation of the refuge. We are always looking for new members who are also interested in supporting the refuge. So we encourage you to check out our website and become a member of the Friends if, if you're interested. On the site, I think Rich will put that in the chat. On the site, you'll also find our calendar that lists our um, monthly bird monitoring walks and any other events that we are sponsoring. Um, right now, I'd like to make you aware of two more presentations that we have planned already for this winter and early spring. We're still in the process of putting some together, but what we do have um, on Thursday, February 3rd, we are going to be hosting our sixth annual evening of bird tales. And this year we're focusing on some stories from local photographers. And we never know exactly what their stories are going to be, but um, we invite you to join in and listen what will no doubt be some amazing stories about some amazing photos. And then out in April, when winter breaks, on Thursday, April 21st, we will again be co-sponsoring an event with GMAS, and this time focusing on the life and migration of the timber doodle or the American woodcock. The bird that lets us know that spring has arrived with its wonderful twilight aerial displays. So again, you can find links to both of those events. Um, they're both going to be online presentations and the links um, to register for those will be on our website. So now I'm going to pass it over to Jeff to tell you a little bit about the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm Jeff Holstrom, the president of the Green Mountain Audubon Society, which is a chapter of the National Audubon Society covering Franklin, Grand Isle, and Chittenden counties. We're very fortunate to have the Missisquoi Refuge in Franklin County for our members and the broader community to explore and enjoy. And our team's really excited to be partnering with the Friends of Missisquoi to bring you Judy's presentation tonight, plus some other events in the future. So we think this is a, a great first step. Judy's presentation is about the Missisquoi Refuge, which has been sacred to indigenous people since time immemorial. The Western Abenaki are the traditional caretakers of these lands and waters. We respect their connection to this region and we remember the hardships that they continue to endure. We give thanks for the opportunity to share this place and to work to protect it. And with that, I will pass it back to Julie. All right, thank you, Jeff. So we are here tonight to gain some insight into the unique habitats contained within the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge and what those habitats mean for bird species here in northern Vermont. And there is no better person to educate us on these places than Judy Sefcik, Missisquoi's own staff biologist. 
So if you have any questions during Judy's presentation, we ask that you place them in the chat and we will address as many as we can at the end of her talk. Judy is a wildlife biologist and a 33 year veteran of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, most recently working at Missisquoi. Having bachelor's and master's degrees in wildlife biology, she's done a variety of things. She's conducted stream surveys in Northern Idaho, studied vernal pools and wintering waterfowl in Northern California, driven airboats to study wetlands in Oregon, surveyed waterfowl and deformed frogs in the prairie potholes of Minnesota, traveled by float plane to study Arctic nesting geese in the YK Delta of Alaska. She lives currently in the woods near Enosburg with three dogs and her binoculars. And her friends say she'd live in the marsh and sleep in her waders if she could. So without further ado, you can take it away, Judy. Well, welcome to Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge, everyone. I'm Judy, I'm the wildlife biologist and I'll be your tour guide this evening. To my right is Joe Bertrand, our very capable captain who can and will get us out of whatever circumstances we find ourselves in tonight. So grab a life jacket, hop on board, and let's get started. Next slide, Rich. For those of you that don't know, um, Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge is around 7,000 acres in size. Um, about 90% of the wildlife refuge is an aquatic environment. And we would, we would be remiss if we didn't start with our most important habitats, our freshwater wetlands. Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge protects around 3,000 acres of Lake Champlain wetlands. And these are some of the most productive and significant freshwater habitats in the Northeast. Next. Uh, no tour uh, would be complete without looking at one of the very unique features of this wetland ecosystem. And this is the Bird's Foot Delta. It's the Missisquoi River when it branches into three different branches, the East Branch, the middle branch and the west branch, forming what looks to some like a bird's foot delta as it empties into Lake Champlain. Um, this is a very critical link for migratory birds in the Atlantic Flyway. Um, uh, the wetlands also host about 50% of the Champlain Valley's waterfowl. And we have the largest concentrations of waterfowl in Vermont um, in the Missisquoi wetlands. In 2013, the Missisquoi Delta and Bay Wetlands were recognized by the Ramsar designation, which is um, a, a designation of conservation and protection of wetlands uh, as wetlands of international importance. So this is a really big deal um, to get that recognition. Next. So with only 41 Ramsar wetlands designated in the United States and only about 2,300 worldwide, um, you may say to yourself, why Missisquoi? Why is this place um, so special? Ramsar has certain criteria that um, a place has to fall into. And besides containing rare and unique natural wetland habitats, um, these wetlands support vulnerable species, some at very critical stages in their life cycle. It also supports uh, threatened and endangered species. It regularly supports um, 20,000 or more water, water birds at a time. And it's an important fishery, not only for um, sources of food for native fish, but also uh, containing spawning grounds and nursery areas for fisheries too. All this adds up to um, the size, location, and diversity of wetland habitats that really provide um, biological diversity to this region. Um, Missisquoi wetlands are some rare habitats. Um, as you can see on the right, um, that's our pitch pine woodland bog. It's the only one of its kind in Vermont. Uh, the bog is around 900 acres in size. It's a scrub shrub bog 
that is um, very impenetrable uh, to try to get in and out of it. Um, it hosts uh, very uh, unique plant communities, including uh, the state threatened Virginia chain fern and Rhodora. We also have um, on your left, the largest expanse of floodplain forest left in the state of Vermont. And this is a really nice corridor for migratory birds and nesting birds in the refuge. Uh, we also um, have the entire nesting population of state endangered black terns on the refuge. Uh, the, the photo you see is of a lake sturgeon, but this is just one fish in a very um, biodiverse fishery that we have. Um, like I said, it's an important spawning ground and nursery. And we have fish as diverse as the long-nosed gar, which I really appreciate watching in the Cisco Bay. Um, there's a world-class bass fishery and even the grasslands uh, across from the headquarters building turn into a uh, northern pike nursery when the backwaters of Lake Champlain come in in the springtime. We also have the uh, state threatened uh, spiny softshell turtle. The Missisquoi population is the largest population in Vermont. It's one of two populations. Um, there's around 200 to 300 animals and this is a state threatened species. Um, these spiny softshell turtles are uh, thought to be distinct from spiny softshell turtles in other drainages like the Miss Mississippi River. Um, so that's also a reason uh, why we need to protect them and maintain these populations. And last but not least, um, the Missisquoi River and watershed and wetlands harbor uh, around uh, six state endangered and one state threatened species of freshwater mussel. And you may not know this, but freshwater mussels are one of the most endangered groups of aquatic organisms in North America. So that in, it, in itself is special too. Next. Uh, life is unpredictable and life in the floodplain forest is even more unpredictable than you may think. Um, because we are a natural wetland ecosystem, uh, we really rely on Lake Champlain uh, water levels for our water levels at, in the refuge. So when Lake Champlain is high, um, refuge waters and our wetlands will also be high water. And when um, Lake Champlain waters are low like they were for pretty much the complete year this past year. Um, we struggle to have um, adequate water in our wetlands as well. So this is a pretty unique um, system as far as wildlife refuges go, um, not having a lot of water control. And the Missisquoi River uh, also helps in that. Um, of course, we know about the flood events in the Missisquoi. And um, although our objectives at the refuge are to protect the natural hydrology and maintain native plant diversity, um, that's easier said than done. So this is Joe Bertrand, uh, just looking the situation over. Uh, this is what happened to Cranberry Pool Wetland, our 800 acre uh, wetland unit when the 2011 flood was raging and uh, the Lake Champlain water levels topped 103.2 feet. Um, that was a historical flood. And um, even though the water control structure you can see in this slide, uh, it didn't matter because when the water gets that high, um, it overflows the banks and comes in the backside of Cranberry Pool. So with it came all kinds of trash and debris and logs and um, Joe had to solve this problem. So um, we actually had to run an excavator and uh, he spent a lot of time uh, pulling all these logs and things out of our wetland so that it could function like a wetland. Periodically, we get um, beavers that help us out a bit in low water years um, by damming up some of our wetlands. Um, they're actually helping us hold water, which is better for wildlife and a lot of the aquatic vegetation. Um, so you see uh, Jump and Joe um, going over one of our, those beaver dams uh, on the right hand side of your, your screen. And um, many times um, 
Boat rides are uh, very interesting on the refuge. The higher and drier the beaver dams get, the more interesting it becomes. So next. So in addition to some of the other wetland types I've mentioned, um, there's also wild rice marsh, button bush, tussock sedge marsh, and a variety of others um, within the wildlife refuge. Um, what you're looking at in the top left of the screen is wild rice. It's an extremely valuable uh, food for many species of wildlife, uh, including migratory waterfowl. Um, in the fall, when uh, ducks like the American bl black duck that's pictured here are, mighting are migrating through Missisquoi, um, that is a really high protein food that gives them a lot of energy so they can rest and feed at the refuge and then continue on their uh, southward migration. Not only um, are these plants good for food, but uh, it's also good for cover for some of the breeding waterfowl that we have on the refuge. Uh, like the wood duck, um, when they have um, small broods, uh, oftentimes they'll just swim around uh, kind of the edges and be able to take the ducklings into the cover um, because there's lots of predators on the refuge and lots of things that like to eat ducklings. So uh, it, it helps uh, keep a lot of them safe on the refuge. Uh, we also, like I said, have the entire breeding population of the state endangered terns black terns, and they're a wetland species. And you'll see a, a nesting pair of those at your bottom left-hand screen. And then you'll see um, actually one of their nests with three eggs in it uh, on the right. And this is typical that they have three eggs. Um, this species is very susceptible to human disturbance and it's also susceptible to things like um, wave action and anything that could disrupt their nesting. They tend to build floating water nests, um, so they need to anchor them in some vegetation. And oftentimes you'll find their nests um, within patches of button bush, but in you know, open water areas within the button bush. Um, they sometimes uh, nest on hummocks or bare soil areas within, within the uh, wetlands also. Um, so it's really uh, fun to watch them and their nesting behavior. Next slide. So when Missisquoi National Refuge was um, established in 1943, it was established as a waterfowl refuge because of the uh, magnificent wetland ecosystems. And um, as duck populations um, studied and actually increased over time in the 1980s and 1990s, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service and our refuge um, has a broader look too. Um, so not only are we concerned about waterfowl and other migratory birds, um, but now we're um, also looking at things like pollinators. Um, so these wetland plants, uh, the smartweed, the pickerel weed, button bush, um, bladderwort, that's actually a carnivorous plant, and burrweed, um, although they are fantastic foods for waterfowl um, and other, other birds and other species, um, it's not just for waterfowl anymore, as we're seeing um, num numerous pollinators on the refuge, um, including some at-risk species. And when I say at-risk, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is using that designation for species that have had large declines in their populations. Um, they also uh, are nearing um, a time when they would be uh, put on the endangered and threatened species list uh, for federal, the federal list for species. And so by calling them at risk, um, we're hoping to get additional funding and be able to work on these species, um, hopefully restore some of their populations, gain more information about them, and put them on the road to success so that they'll never have to be um, put on that endangered and threatened species list. So um, we're working on that at Missisquoi and um, enjoying some pollinators, including the monarch butterflies. Lots of species use these valuable wetland plants. Next. 
for our inventory and monitoring efforts. Um, we of course do spring and fall waterfowl surveys to make sure that our wetlands are providing the best habitat that we can. Um, in addition, we do waterfowl banding in the fall to keep track of populations. We help the state and um, it also helps the state and uh, the Atlantic Flyway set uh, waterfowl regulations for waterfowl hunting seasons. Um, we are of course doing the native bee monitoring and the black pair, black turn pair uh, nesting counts. You can see uh, Joe is in the middle of the screen there, um, picking water chestnut. And that is uh, our number one um, priority invasive plant on the refuge. Uh, we started out with about 13,000 rosettes um, in 2005 that need to be handpicked. And by 2020, um, we are down to 367 rosettes being counted on the refuge. Um, it's a major effort. It takes Joe and I about three weeks every summer to work on this. Um, but as of right now, we consider these populations of water chestnut contained and controlled, um, which is a very good thing because we're the northernmost um, stand of water chestnut in Lake Champlain. And we certainly don't want um, Missiscoy Bay or the northern part of Lake Champlain um, to be infested with water chestnut. So um, anyway, if, if any of you know about this insidious plant, uh, you can uh, probably relate to this. Also, along with the uh, waterfowl banding, we sometimes do disease surveillance. Um, we just got a note the other day that, again, we're concerned about um, avian influenza in wild birds. So we'll be on the lookout for that. Um, you can see us here as we're swabbing, uh, taking esophageal and cloacal swabs of waterfowl as we're banding them and then submitting those samples to um, our wildlife health lab for testing. Next. So we're gonna uh, move right along and go to our silver maple sensitive fern floodplain forest. This is also our priority habitat um, for the refuge and the refuge protects the largest and highest quality floodplain forest left in the state. So we have over a thousand acres of this habitat. Next. Uh, this habitat consists of a mature silver, silver maple floodplain forest. And um, this forest is allowed to uh, grow and uh, for plants to naturally succeed. Um, silver maples are a very robust tree. They're tall towering trees that um, have a lot of girth. They have um, large spreading branches at the tops. And uh, one remarkable thing about these trees is when there's wind, high wind or storms, um, these branches can break off and they form natural cavities. So um, they really contribute to housing a lot of the cavity nesting waterfowl that we have on the refuge, um, such as common goldeneye, and wood duck and even hooded mergansers. Um, in addition, uh, this floodplain forest um, has a lot of migrating and breeding land birds. Um, when the rusty uh, blackbird um, blitz was going on to uh, look for rusty blackbirds in habitat, I think that was uh, 2014 and 2015, um, we actually found something interesting about the refuge that it contained the highest numbers of these birds while migrating in the state of Vermont. And if you think about it, it, it shouldn't really be a surprise because um, with this flood floodplain forest habitat, the moist soil, um, the wet conditions, and um, these birds liking to probe into the sediment for uh, insects and invertebrates, it really is a good habitat for them. So. Uh, it was exciting to learn about that. Other species like scarlet tanagers, um, Baltimore Orioles, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, these are all forest birds that are declining. And um, the refuge acts uh, as a nice corridor uh, for both um, migrating species and breeding land birds. Uh, in 2000, 
13 and 14, we actually put out acoustic monitoring devices to be able to detect bats using our floodplain forest as well. And we also found some really interesting um, things from that study, including um, that in the Northeast, we were one of the wildlife refuges that had the most diversity of bats. Um, we had um, seven species of bats, including the state endangered little brown bat, the tricolored bat, and also uh, the state threatened Eastern small footed bat. Um, again, the floodplain forest adjacent to our wetlands and river system, it's just a a very nice mix of feeding habitat, um, roosting habitat for these tree uh, nesting bats and even maternal colonies. Next. So I've mentioned Mississippi's floodplain forest for cavity nesting waterfowl, but I wanted to uh, quantify that and just um, figure out how good um, is our floodplain forest for these nesting waterfowl. So uh, in 2015 and 2016, we hosted a graduate student from SUNY Plattsburgh, um, along with his technicians and professor, and they did a cavity uh, study for us in our floodplain forest. They also did a forest inventory looking at uh, the component of different trees and shrubs in the habitat, and they um, also uh, looked at the, determined the density of natural cavities and looked at the characteristics for natural cavities that house ducks. Uh, what they found was about 44% of trees were of cavity bearing size in our floodplain forest. So that was really encouraging. Um, they also determined that the density of natural cavities is around one cavity per acre, which is fantastic. Um, in the Northeast, uh, a lot of studies have not been done on cavity nesting waterfowl. Uh, the Midwest has done a lot of research on that. Um, so in addition to fulfilling what we needed information for at the refuge, uh, this information um, really uh, was a, um, added data to this data gap in the Northeast. Um, they also described physical characteristics for natural cavities and um, they recommended their management recommendations included that although this forest is excellent habitat, they would still recommend uh, we have a small number of nesting boxes for waterfowl. So we keep around 40 and just as additional places since there are so many cavity nesting waterfowl in this area. You can see um, the technician who has a telescoping pole and he has a camera attached to that and they're actually peering into uh, and looking at uh, cavities um, with this device. Next. And you can also see the technician as he's um, doing his Tarzan impressions for the forest and um, they were climbing trees and uh, throwing ropes over trees and doing all sorts of fun things to get this information for us. So um, we were really glad to have them, uh, glad for their enthusiasm and even more glad for the information they provided to us. Next. So um, just like I was saying for wetlands, uh, not just for waterfowl anymore, uh, neither is the floodplain forest. Um, we have additional at-risk species uh, for this region, and those are cerulean warbler that we don't have uh, many of at the refuge, um, very rarely, but, and wood thrush is also another species that we need to pay more attention to. So if you are out and about in a kayak or um, walking through areas of the refuge, um, if you do see wood thrush, uh, please note that in your eBird list. That's important information for us to have. Um, these, uh, the understory plants in the floodplain forest, uh, like spotted touch me not, swamp candles, beggar sticks, they all have flowers that are uh, very important 
spore pollinators also. So we are also are looking um, in this area for pollinator species. And um, a couple years ago, when we were looking at and checking our wood duck boxes and cleaning them out for spring to get ready for the, the nesting season, um, we actually thought, found in a couple of them expired bumblebee nests, which was really exciting. Um, bumblebees, you may know, are annual nesters. Um, the queen uh, sets up the colony for the year. She does all the work herself, um, selects a, um, a place to have the colony and does the work until uh, her female workers arrive and help her out. And then she just lays eggs and produces um, the colony after that. So um, finding her nesting in these boxes was really unique. Uh, bumblebees are typically ground nesters or they nest slightly above the ground. And these wood duck boxes were about six and 10 feet off the ground. So um, it was interesting to share this with some bumblebee experts and um, you know, hear what they had to say about it. It's not something that you see all the time. Next. Again, for the floodplain forest, we're looking um, at objectives of protecting the natural hydrology, um, looking at restoring and um, aiding native plant diversity, uh, like the native blue iris that we're always happy to see. Um, but at the bottom of a 767,000 acre Missisquoi River watershed, um, that's not always easy. And again, Joe is uh, assessing the water control situation. As you can see above his shoulder, uh, there's a white line and that white line on the trees around the refuge is depicting how high the water was in that historic 2011 flood that I was telling you about. So um, water control, not so much, but an unpredictable and exciting place, that's for sure. Next. Uh, with flooding, flooding happens and so do invasive plants. So the bad thing about flooding is um, that with it, it brings um, seeds and roots and stems and other components of um, invasive plants that are not managed upstream in the watershed. So plants like yellow iris, uh, phragmites or common reed and Japanese knotweed are uh, really important invasives that we need to control in the floodplain forest habitat. Um, so we've been working on that for a number of years. Uh, you're getting more flooding shots the, at the top of your screen. Um, what looks as, like a grassy area is in fact um, cranberry pool dike. And normally that is six to 10 feet above water. Uh, you see the water control structure there again in cranberry pool. Um, and this, um, the area was so flooded that um, Cranberry Pool and Big Marsh Slough, another one of our 800 acre wetlands, um, really were just divided by this uh, strip of grass, it looked like, um, making it a very unusual circumstance. Um, Joe and I would cruise around the entire refuge using our shallow water go devil boat after the flooding happened. And for those of you who know uh, the Route 78 boat launch at Louis Landing um, and the parking lot there, it was all under about six feet of water. Um, so we would go out and assess uh, damage to the infrastructure as well as um, look at the public use trails. And we would, um, there's Joe tying up one of our floating boardwalks that um, usually is part of the trail system. So uh, always something to do at Mrs. Sway. You never, you never know what's gonna happen. Next. As I said, we are uh, really um, doing a lot of work in our floodplain forest with aquatic invasive plants and invasive plants like knotweed and phragmites. Um, uh, we have a lot of uh, refuge volunteers to thank for this work. Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to Paul Madden, who's been uh, helping us with this effort since 2013. Uh, John and Kim Cheserak have also helped and walked the floodplain forest looking for these plants. And Ken Whitehead is another person that's helped out. 
And not only has Ken uh, walked the floodplain for us, but he's also our boat driver, uh, making the refuge volunteers, allowing them to work independently, which is great, so that um, Joe and I can do some other things that day. So uh, in looking at um, some of the monitoring of these plants, we're seeing that knotweed and phragmites is pretty much controlled and contained for the moment, um, but it's a continual process. Um, and we're continually trying to reduce stems and patches on the refuge. Uh, the grid that we use um, to look for uh, yellow iris, as you can see, um, the red dots were iris plants, yellow iris plants in 2019. And because of the management efforts out there, uh, in 2020, we only had about three of those patches left. So it's good news, yet, um, you know, we always need to be aware that um, flooding and other events are going to bring, uh, potentially bring invasive onto the refuge, especially the floodplain forest. Again, uh, the native bee inventory, uh, migrating and breeding land bird surveys, looking at our waterfowl nest boxes, uh, and uh, we monitor colonial nesting water birds, osprey, and eagle nests on the refuge. Next. So we're gonna um, get off the water and we're gonna go into um, our grassland habitats. Um, that is also a priority habitat uh, for Missisquoi. And um, we have the largest contiguous grassland in the state of Vermont at 300 and some acres. Um, Steve Perrin, if anyone knew him, he was the the turtle biologist for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, he just retired a little while ago. He also worked on birds and um, said that Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge manages and protects the largest and highest quality grassland habitat in the state. So high praise from him. And um, for those of you who know Alan Strong, an ornithology professor at UVM, um, when I was first here, uh, Alan visited our grasslands and I was uh, just questioning him about what we could do better, how we could better manage th this area, um, what his thoughts were. And he just turned to me and said, if I were a grassland bird, I'd be here. So um, that, was, that was great for me to hear and it relieved my anxiety about having to manage these, uh, these grasslands. Um, next. Again, um, we're looking at mesic grasslands. Uh, primarily, we can manage them for grassland nesting birds like bobolinks and savanna sparrows. Um, <clears throat> there's, they're also um, migrating and breeding land birds. American woodcock use these fields for both breeding and migration. Um, one thing that the refuge does that makes these fields so attractive for birds are uh, unlike the surrounding um, hay fields or agricultural lands in Vermont, that um, because of recent technology and improvements in farming practices and uh, machinery and things like that, those fields are now cut um, three to four times during the growing season. At Missisquoi, um, you can see that uh, our grasslands are closed to the public. Um, we also don't do any management in them from April to uh, August 15th. That way the birds can come in and nest pretty much undisturbed and um, they can actually raise their young to fledgling stage before uh, going back and uh, traveling back to where they're gonna winter. Uh, for bobolinks, they come a long way from South America. So they need to quickly nest and get their young off and then return back South uh, to make it make it back home. Um, anyway, uh, so it's it's really important that we manage these fields this way and um, we are really striving to do the best for the grassland birds since they are also a, a, a group of birds that have had huge population declines um, over the years. Next. 
Uh, and I shouldn't forget uh, the, uh, if, for those of you who saw that, um, the Eastern Meadowlark popped up and that is a now a state threatened species. Um, I was very happy to report last year that we had five nesting pairs at the refuge, which was really exciting. Um, sometimes we have less than that. Uh, it's always exciting just to see one pair out there. But um, when we were on the edges of these grasslands and doing some of our pollinator surveys, uh, oftentimes we were serenaded by eastern meadowlarks. So that was that was pretty special. Next. Uh, here we are in 2018 doing our native bumblebee inventory. Um, this is the first time we did anything with pollinators on the refuge. Um, you'll see Leif Richardson, uh, a bumblebee expert. He led uh, the study and we assisted him. Um, he's knowledgeable about bumblebees and could identify all species uh, in the field. So it was great to have him. Uh, and regional support from our regional office, that's Becky Longenecker. Um, as we were collecting these bees and doing um, a survey uh, where we just looked at them, photographed them, and then released them back into the habitat. Next. Uh, as I said, um, this was our bumblebee survey. Um, we had 12 species of bumblebees that we found, which is really good. It represents about 75% of bumblebees in the state of Vermont. Um, you can forward the slides a little bit, uh, Rich. We have some stars that are showing up here. Um, we had some common species, but we also had some species that are rare in Vermont, um, like Bombus vegans, Bombus sandersoni, uh, Ternarius, and even um, one bumblebee, that hadn't been seen since 1963. Even though um, Vermont had an outstanding effort doing bumblebee uh, surveys for a couple of years throughout Vermont, and they had examined over 10,000 specimens, um, the Fernald's cuckoo bumblebee um, wasn't located then. So it was really great that these surveys happened at the refuge. Um, like I said, they hadn't been seen in a long time. and. Um, it was exciting, very exciting news for us. Um, yellow banded bumblebee and lemon cuckoo bumblebee, which are the at-risk species that we're focusing on, uh, those were found during this survey too. Next. So um, the million dollar question now is uh, how to manage grasslands for birds and for bees. Um, we need to figure this out uh, and figure it out soon. Uh, what uh, techniques are good for birds like haying and mowing uh, after the breeding season may not necessarily be good for um, hibernating queens or um, solitary nesting bees on the refuge. So uh, we definitely need to figure that out. And um, right now we are doing a all wild native bee inventory on the refuge. So there are over 350 species of native wild bees. And um, we're in the process of collecting and photographing as many of those as we can. Um, as predicted, uh, the refuge contains a very unique assemblage of native bees so far. Um, we haven't um, identified all of the specimens yet. But right now we have around 92 species of bees that we found on the refuge. Uh, three species that are not found anywhere else in Vermont and one species which was unknown to New England before it was found on the refuge. So um, quite interesting news there too. Um, like I said, we do uh, breeding grassland bird nesting surveys. Um, again, we're trying to control invasives, specifically uh, spotted knapweed in our refuge grasslands. Um, again, these grasslands were overrun um, with, you know, a near monoculture of spotted knapweed in 2011, even though we had tried to use mechanical methods or um, hand picking and things like that to prevent the spread. Um, but in 2020, after managing uh, these invasives uh, by spot spraying them, um, we are now at uh, between zero and 7% um, of napweed in these 
grassland fields, and that's really good news too. Uh, with most of the uh, invasive species on the refuge, we'll never eradicate the populations, but at least we can keep them at low levels. So uh, there won't be like hostile takeovers of the habitat and um, they will actually, uh, the habitats will actually function as they're supposed to for the resources that we have at the refuge. Um, we also do a woodcock singing ground survey uh, in the spring, and that tells us um, how good our grasslands are for um, springtime woodcock. Next. So uh, the bottom line for the wildlife refuge is expect the unexpected. Stay tuned, um, not only with water levels, uh, but with species and habitats changing and in flux. Um, it's a new day now that climate change is here. So uh, we never know what to expect. Um, sometimes we see uh, rare or different species on the refuge, um, like the pelican that hang, hung around Missisquoi Bay for the better part of summer one year. Um, we had a refuge greeter who was a typical, um, <laughs> a typical uh, friend of the refuge, but usually doesn't um, put himself right by the front doors and greet visitors as they're coming in. So that snapping turtle was an interesting day. Um, in addition, um, the moose that showed up when I was in the refuge grasslands doing my grassland bird surveys one day, um, that was an interesting observation too, because um, I've been to the I've been working at the refuge for about 15 years now. And in that period of time, I've only seen two moose. Um, so that was an interesting surprise, uh, kind of a shocking surprise to have a moose running full blown towards me as I'm trying to do my grassland bird surveys. Um, you see Joe who's in the thick of the scrub shrub wetland in the pitch pine woodland bog. Um, sometimes, uh, our grassland fields, when they back up with water and act as uh, spring pools and spring wetlands, um, sometimes we'll get uh, unusual goose visitors um, like snow geese that showed up in a field uh, one day in spring. Uh, they're not our typical uh, refuge visitors, but it was interesting to have them. Um, Steve Perrin was always great in bringing uh, his uh, home reared spiny soft shell turtles um, to the refuge and we would help him release them back into Missisquoi Bay. So um, when you're out and about, you just never know what you're gonna see or hear or what's gonna happen at the refuge. Um, I invite all of you to come and uh, enjoy the refuge, um, take a walk on the refuge, um, kayak or canoe on the refuge. Um, please stop at the Refuge Visitor Center before doing so. We have trail maps for you and we have um, maps to show you where you can and where you can't um, kayak and canoe. Uh, since we are a national wildlife refuge, we have a motto of wildlife first. So we are not as open to the public as some other areas um, like state lands, for instance, or even um, parks. Um, we do allow recreation, but um, we also need to have closed areas so that the refuge uh, can provide the feeding and resting habitat that um, our species of concern need. So I uh, hope to see you at the refuge someday and uh, let me know if you just stop in. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, we will, I think some questions came in, it's my understanding. If anybody has any Oops. questions, we want to uh, put those in there. So Rich, do you want to yes, take I it? I have one here? about how the refuge is controlling knotweed or what are they doing to control knotweed? Uh, we are actually um, cutting it uh, about four times during the growing season. And then we have um, contractors going in and using aquatic use glyphosate um, to uh, spray the plants at the end of the field season, which usually occurs in like August um, or September. And then a question about what are the colonial nesting water birds? Um, so uh, I've lived around this area uh, for a while. 
You may remember that uh, Missisquoi used to have a, a very large uh, great blue heron rookery. Um, we also had some great egrets in there periodically, and we also had um, a few double crested cormorants at times. Um, in 2011, that all changed when bald eagles um, set up shop and we had the first bald eagle nest on the refuge. Um, after that, um, we have more bald eagles nesting. So we have about three pair of nesting eagles on the refuge now. In addition, we have uh, two other pairs that are very close by the refuge. Um, so that has caused the herons um, some strife and they have abandoned certain portions of, of uh, the refuge rookery. Um, they were declining um, and trying to set up a new rookery in various places on the refuge, but they were just never successful. Um, they really liked the Shad Metcalf Island area that was their traditional site. And so um, in 2021, for the first time, we actually had no nesting herons on the refuge, um, which is you know, disappointing, but I will say that even though they're not nesting, um, we see hundreds of herons, uh, great egrets, uh, green herons on the refuge uh, feeding and um, going about their day. So what the birds that left our colony, um, I know that there's um, a colony that's now in North Hero, it's on private land. And, um, you know, our birds, although they have been displaced from the refuge for now, I'm hoping at some point we may get a rookery back and um, they are being successful in other places. Okay, well, that answered one of our other questions about the rookery. Um, how about how are algae blooms being dealt with? Uh, well, um, the refuge uh, collects samples for algae testing periodically. Um, and we are very concerned about water quality. Um, we report things like fish kills and mussel die-offs um, to the state partners. Um, and we are, get involved in testing um, when and if they tell us to. Um, but for the most part, um, the that is the state's responsibility in state waters. Um, so, and, you know, groups like Missisquoi, um, River Basin Association and Friends of Northern Lake Champlain, they're doing a lot of the water quality testing as well. Um, it is a, a lot of concern uh, for us at the refuge and someday we would like um, to actually have a, a water quality program of our own. Uh, side effects from spraying for invasives. Um, have you noticed any? I mean, or are we seeing any? So, do you mean um, to the ecosystem or to other species? Uh, yes. Well, I imagine either way. Okay. Well, um, we are using um, uh, the lowest toxicity chemical glyphosate that we can. Um, we also have. Um, I'm a state certified pesticide applicator, so I had to go to classes and pass a test and do trainings um, to be able to do that on the refuge. Um, we use um, spot sprayers, we use backpack sprayers, we walk and we spray individual plants and um, we do everything in our power to make sure that, um, you know, we're not just haphazardly spraying areas. Um, there are a lot of rules when it comes to applying pesticides. Um, the wind speed has to be uh, less than 10 miles an hour and you have to have certain climate conditions and weather. Uh, you can't be spraying when it's um, the possibility of rain. Um, so we are very cautious. And I have to say that using chemicals on the refuge is really a last resort. Um, we really prefer to do um, mechanical means like mowing or doing some other things to keep invasives at bay if we can. Uh, we did a lot of hand pulling at first, but at a certain point, you just can't keep up and you're not being effective. So in order to keep these really bad invasives at bay, um, unfortunately, we have to use the herbicides. Well, and I'll just throw in a plug for the friends group now while we're talking about it. But the last five or six years, we've been probably averaging $10,000 a year in 
invasive species control. Yeah, and yeah. that um, the for friend, people that are wondering where the membership money is going to, that's where a lot of it is. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Rich. Um, the friends apply for a grant, and that ten thousand um, dollars goes far in helping us with, um, especially these really bad pervasive invasives along the floodplain forests, like Japanese knotweed and Phragmites. Say great presentation, Judy. Thank, thanks for thanks for for doing it. Just a plug for the friends. Uh, Judy mentioned the uh, headquarters on the refuge, and the Friends of Musiskoi operates a store there. So if you're going into the refuge headquarters and the store is open, you'll uh, you'll find a great a great way to support the Friends of Musiskoi and the activities on the refuge. I will add though, with COVID staffing right at the moment, it's more by appointment. But thanks. But we will we will work with anyone that's looking for stuff. Well, we thank you, Judy, for all of the information that you gave everybody. Um, thank you to GMAS for co-hosting with us. It's um, hopefully the first in a, in a string of things that we can do together. So um, I hope everybody stays warm and gets a chance to get out and see the refuge in the winter. It's just as beautiful as in the spring and the fall. So um, be sure to make a trip and we'll see you out there. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.